uh, I'll begin by uh, exploring some conceptual and philosophical ideas. Although they may be uh, complex, I'll try to present them in a clear way. I believe they are necessary to help me ground my recent research work beyond the interesting images we produced for it. So bear with me for a moment and I promise you there will be a nice dessert in the end. Next. Yeah, next. Let's talk about what is histor historicity and historical consciousness. And I use the words and the, the, the uh, teachings of the philosopher Agnes Heller, which uh, she, in her book, A Theory of History, that was actually from 1980s, no? uh, she says that history, historicity is not just something which happened to us. It is not a property propensity in, uh, we slip into it as if it was a garment. We are historicity. We are time and space. For her, historical consciousness is the answer to the question, where have we come from? Who we are? Where are we going? There is not only one historical consciousness, it manifests itself along the history in many ways, according to different substances and structures. That diverse aspects is what she calls the stages of historical consciousness. Since I have limited time here, I will not explain about all the six stages of historical consciousness that she explains in her book. Suffice to say that they are not meant to be read as a progression or a evolu an evolution in the positivist sense of the word. They may exist simultaneously. They are often mixed and garbled in our daily life. Here, I will concentrate on what she calls the sixth stage or the conscious the historical consciousness of reflected generality as a task it seems complicated but it's not like that it is an aspect uh, uh, that is yet under construction through our contemporary concerns goals and best efforts she proposes that in this sixth stage the philosophy of history is being integrated into the philosophy of nature as ecological consciousness, including the notion of our natural limits and the awareness about our transgressions against nature, which renders us all conscious of the restricted and fragile existence of our civilization. On the other hand, humankind as an idea has now become a fact. Our, presence, our present history is in fact a world history. This planet is our home and it will either be a home for everyone or for no one, says her and we concur. Due to that, for the first time in history, human beings have to take a planetarian responsibility. But the responsibility in itself is not yet a commitment, as it can evoke and reinforce the feeling of impotence, of confusion or unhappiness in our consciousness. To be fully committed, a planetarian responsibility must deal with ethics. Are we still able to differentiate between good and evil? Are we ready to work on the ethics of a planetary responsibility together? We certainly don't know, but as Brecht said in his play, The Caucasian Shark Circle, terrible is the temptation to, go to do good. What are we responsible for? 
only for the present, says Altmaier's Heller. But present is quite a complex concept. To better understand it, Heller differentiates its aspects. She states that the various forms of present in historicity can be circumscribed by the terms just now, now, and the now, and, this, and that these three aspects of the present are to be combined in the idea of being together or togetherness. We are in the present. And we are the present. We are together with those living since we too are living, since we act and think for them and against them. We are together with the dead insofar as we tell their stories. And we are together with those not yet born insofar as they live in us as a promise and as faith. Togetherness is contemporaneity. It is not past or future. It's the absolute present, the now. As Heller considers it, it is very important to realize that the past or the present of the present and the future of the present are events. They are not interpretations. They are things in themselves. They are not explanations. When we try to understand the present and its extensions to past and to future, in historical terms, we create con concatenations and narratives to give them substance and intelligibility in the present and for the use of the present. The result of those efforts are never absolute their expiration date tends to be quite short, actually. What we call as historical present is not a fact, not, nor it is an event. It is a narrative embedded with, by cultural uh, structures. Each cultural structure will interpret the facts differently according to their conscious and unconscious awareness. As I said, Agnes Heller philosophical propositions are quite more compli complex than that, of course. For example, she explains how in fact we live in simultaneously in three presents, three pasts and three futures, and that uh, indeed we can reconstruct the past in different ways from the viewpoint of all three presents. Again, due to the pressure of time, I will not go into details about that, but I'd like to quote a very meaningful passage of her text, remembering it's written in the 1980s, that I'll take as the start for my further considerations today. I'm quoting uh, Agnes Heller. Generations have been infected in their school years by the subject called history. School texts and, so, and all sorts of books about history did their utmost to legitimize irrational actions, hatred, van, revenge, violence, force, and the feeling of superiority in their relations with the past. Hero worship, the glorification of mass murders, and the vilification of the ever given out group have been the common course taken by various ideologies of history. In such an atmosphere, the question that inevitably arises is, how could we make the reconstruction of the past and the present and the future, in how this can be achieved through rational communication and not in this terms anymore? of course. For her, that means that in the first place, we have to assume that neither the past nor the future justify anything we want to do in the present. We are working in the present for the present. 
our present actions, goals, endeavors, and attitudes can only be justified by rational arguments grounded on our present consciousness, on our here and our now. As so, the past can only play the part of a lesson and the future the part of a regulative idea. Besides, she considers that the main goal for a more rational reconstruction of the past would be to accept our togetherness, our contemporaneity as our own. That sounds obvious, but it's not. To contrast the greatness of the past to the pettiness of the present, or the projected purity of the future to the sinfulness of the present, it's a very common trait, but it's a sterile one. We have to accept this present because it's the only one we have. But of course, without any sort of reconciliation. Our togetherness is our contemporaneity. It will approach the past, not only in order to find out the meaning, the sense, the value of former historical actions, objectifications and agents, but also in order to disclose what is there in common between them and us. Now, in approaching each past history, we communicate with humankind, humankind. And art and architecture, says Heller and we concur, of course, enable us to incorporate all past, present ages into our present, present age. Heller also proposes some simple procedures to prevent us from approaching history with the biases and prejudices of our historical present. It is what she calls radical hermeneutics. I think I am in the process of understanding her lessons, but still not quite. It's a work in progress and I, it will probably take a lifetime. But even if my understanding is still imp imperfect, her words are helping me in my current studies and researches, which may be synthesized as a tentative of rereading history from our present togetherness. Let me have some water. How can we approach the past from our present togetherness? And should we work on how and should we work on that? Why should we care? In the now, today, about 20th century modern architecture, to explain my position on this subject as a professor and as a researcher, I will briefly consider how the teaching of the history of architecture often, not always, but very often happens in most of our schools of architecture. I don't know the reality, <laughs> Uh, of course, here in the United States, but I'm talking about my place in Brazil and in Latin America. Contemporary attitude regarding the learning of the history of architecture in our schools of architecture is certainly contradictory. For instance, it is never given the same amount of interest, time and place as the design classes. And we take for granted that such attitude is the natural state of things. Have you ever thought about that? It is supposed to be taught in wholesale form, format, meaning by one professor for dozens of students ratio through lectures to be passively heard and not in hands-on workshops. In these conditions, the recourse to canonical books and panoramic surveys as the main support for the teaching tends to be almost inevitable. In these conditions, history courses barely have the time to give the students a whiff of culture. We tend to believe that this is all for the best since the real goal would be to teach the craft design and to stimulate innovation, meaning to transcend all things past 
and to delve into the seas of an inventive future. That attitude usually foments a sort of disregard or even a disrespect for the past and the previously established knowledge, except when the past is superficially cannibalized into a sort of clever but sketchy justification for a supposedly new design. Our past is not studied in our architectural school as approached from this present historicity and the present togetherness. It is assessed not in a reflexive way, but by the repetition of what other people, mostly male, wild, white European sort of people, has written in the past about that. Almost a century ago, stories that have been repeated and extended by the following authors, but quite never confronted. Actually, what we know of today as the modern architecture history came into being very precautiously. Its inception happens almost simultaneously as the proposal of some of the first modern architecture buildings and places. It was founded by the praising of those few examples, and these early writings were quickly set into history books. To give them depth and importance, those buildings were postulated as the exemplification of a sort of new tradition. And as it happens with almost all traditions, that one was just born there and then. The precocious inception of that history of architecture was also based on the ideals of revolution against the past and innovation towards the future. Paradoxically, that provoked an unsustainable situation for the next generations of architects. Change was fated to be seen both as a desirable trait and as an ultimate treason to the so-called pioneers' intentions. Since that historicity, though pretending to be universal, was born and grounded in very few and geographically circumscribed examples, superficially examined and hastily extrapolated as universal paradigms, a limited number of architects and their works were given authority over everybody else, then and forever, congealing the definition of what was meant to be understood as properly modern from then on. We can see how this construct cannot help but be insufficient for a contemporary regard. But that history was such a strong and successful endeavor that despite our present perception of its faults, we keep on using these books that canonize those narratives despite our present perceptions uh, and the authors uh, uh, that, can, that, sorry, that canonize those narratives, authors and works in a quite uncritical uh, way. Moreover, we keep on believing in their righteousness and objectivity, even when it is clear for me and I'm sure, I'm sure for all of you, how their interpretation of what is or what should be called modern architecture is biased, partial, prejudiced, and limited. One of the after effect effects of this realization is that instead of questioning this worn out paradigm, we prefer to ignore it. So we tend to believe that we are in the contemporaneity doing something else different than modern architecture. Contemporary architecture does not accept to be called modern anymore since it is so obviously di different from what these canonical books say about modern, what a modern architecture was meant to be. In a loop that furthers the disregard and disrespect of the past and keep the learning of architectural history as a secondary, unmeaningful and boring task.
Well, depending on the definition that is given to the word, contemporary architecture is modern, I'm sorry to say, uh, or else it traits closely there and derived from modernity in many of its practical and imaginary aspects. In one hand, it has not yet completely fulfilled the dreams and utopias of the modern avant-garde, but it keeps on trying even if in a disenchanted way. In the other hand, it still believes in some abstract dualities that were put in place by modern architects and historians as principles and criteria uh, to judge what is or what is not good in architecture. Like for example, form as something that should be against function concerns on materiality as something that tends to be against concerns on space, autonomy of the object as something that tends to be against uh, context and place, change as opposed con to conservation, etc., etc. Contemporary architecture or architects also keep on believing in several myths that were put forth by the romantic view of architecture as an artistic creation, endorsed in so many ways across all these canonical books, like the idea of an author working isolated, achieving wonders through the sparks of his genius. It's his genius because it's usually a male person, but even when we include female personages, we tend to treat them as magnificent, sublime, exceptional exceptions, nevertheless. We keep on believing that the architecture of the mainstream examples of the so-called central places are certainly more important than the examples, examples built elsewhere. And, they are, and the examples built elsewhere are only admitted when filtered through the lenses of some sort of secondary attributes like regionalist or weird or countercultural or identitarian, et cetera, et cetera. I can go on indefinitely on this subject. Uh, for quite some time, I have been working on the possibility of critically understanding several of the different aspects of the debates on the historiographic canons their inceptions, their perpetuations. And I had already published some of my ideas about that in my last, and they will be present in my next book too. But instead of just recognizing the situation, I fancy to do something to help change this panorama. Uh, and that comes to my last, my recent research, which is the recogni recognizing the canon and its gaps through a case, a case study, the Brazilian case. To better understand the complexities involved in the making of the canonical narratives on modern architecture, I thought it would be fundamental to select for a more thorough case study some particularly durable narrative, preferably if it's spread out through several history books along some extended period. And for a first experiment, it would be better to have a somewhat cohesive, ample, but not too widespread case study. And of course, I had something like that quite near and familiar to me, the consolidated written narratives on Brazilian modern architecture history. I figured that I could use their study as a starting point uh, to systematically confirm the existence of a canonical narrative because it's not so easy to prove that there is a canonical narrative, believe me. Uh, it's obvious, but when you try to do that systematically, it's not so obvious as that. Uh, and it could be a way to contemplate also the meaningful voids of emptiness that they are obliquely defined, these canonical narratives are obliquely defining many voids, many places never heard of, many places we never go there. Perhaps with that awareness, we can construct or build a, a, a present consciousness of these historical traits. And for the future would be also, also very interesting too. 
So, um, since it, it, the, its beginning, Brazilian modern architecture was recognized as a significant and cohesive and ensemble of works and authors. A mature narrative reporting its existence and importance was already in construction in the 1930s, at the same time as the more prestigious European version was also under construction. It's not, uh, it, that's a common mistake. Ah, it's the, uh, after the, the other construction. No, everything was happening at the same time. This is very interesting. Uh, the first uh, modern houses were in, in Europe in the 20s. There are first modern houses in the 20s everywhere in the world, in Mexico, in Argentina, here in the United States, everywhere. They, they, there is no such thing as first in Europe and then the other places. It's not true. Just check the dates. We tend to believe that because we are fascinated by this narrative. Fascinated in the sense of a snake fascinating you, like that, kind of. The canonical narrative about Brazilian modern architecture is well known everywhere. It's still believed as representing an unauthorized and meaningful explanation of the facts. So almost no one dares to confront it. Despite being born almost a century ago, uh, it persists almost unscattered until today. And it still colors the appreciation of either modern or contemporary Brazilian architecture, which is, if you stop to think about that, a quite unique situation, actually a most incredible one. And I mean incredible in the many different senses of the word. Having started in the 1930s for, from the effort of and merit of its protagonists, these written narratives soon were consolidated as representing Brazilian modern architecture with the immediate and providential support of prestigious foreign help. So this first book is, you all, you all know about the Brazil builds, uh, uh, catalog of the exhibitions in 1942 in, in the MoMA in New York. It gained a noteworthy persistency and duration in time, and it's probably one of the only so-called regional cases providing at least a dozen well-known panoramic reviews written by different authors throughout almost a century. And its precocity and longevity make it a very interesting case for an experimental systematic study or, or a first step to achieve some meaningful insights about how canons are established and maintained. This consecrated narrative on Brazilian modern architecture is stricken by a paradoxical conviction. On the one hand, it longs for its reconnaissance as modern, thus aspiring to belong to a broader universal stance. On the other hand, it wants to be qualified as national, thus suggesting the attainment of specific traits and a relatively autonomous stance. This double condition confronts and tenses European North and Northern Hemisphere canonical narratives of modern architecture, not by conflicting, but by diverging, uh, though only in, in part. Almost a century after its inception, despite discrete variations in tone, this need of recognition as modern and national remains and prevails in almost every local or international attempt to establish any panoramic narrative on Brazilian architecture, modern, contemporary, or otherwise. The starting point of this critical study uh, of modern Brazilian architecture was to select a significant number of books of panoramic scope and effectively give the, the survey a, a certain representativeness. So we selected these eight books that are presented here. One of them was, was uh, here is only seven because I, it's not my, my own book is in the survey too, but I, I, I forgot to include it. It's, it's, it's what Freud calls uh, up to five, but fail, fail act something like that. Well, uh, it is eight books or, uh, uh, or exhibition catalogs were published in different decades. This is the 40s, the 50s, 
uh, the 50s, uh, end of the 50s, the 60s and 70s, the, the 80s, the 90s, the 20, 20, uh, 100, and, uh, and this is very recent one. They are still accessible nowadays in bookstores, in most university libraries, in online versions, and they are often adopted as basic textbooks in architectural education curricula. So they fulfilled all the conditions for me to analyze them as living objects. They are being used today. They are not the past past. So. Um, the research organizes a survey of all the buildings and authors mentioned in each and every one of these books. The resulting spreadsheets in include almost a thousand examples. Each book was studied by checking its content uh, and how it was distributed among the decades that it comprises, which regions and cities of Brazil are covered or not covered, which buildings and authors stand out, how these uh, highlights are treated, number of pages, number of words, number of images each one are given, among many other aspects. The data was treated then uh, using 2D and 3D graphics that were very helpful to deal with this huge amounts of information in an easy and clear visual way. So how do we interpret all this information? And we are, uh, this is uh, the graphics. In, uh, the first graphics we did using only two books, uh, one book, the other book, and the combination of two, it was an experiment. And this is the 3D differences. So we, we see how in the beginning, uh, people, uh, this is, uh, of course, is Noska Niemeyer's. Uh, it's very well, many, many times quoted, many, many times. But uh, as, as the time goes on, less and less architects are quoted so many times. So the, the era of the heroes, and then another panorama comes down, and you can see visually all these ideas, which helped us understand them too, and gave us some surprises. We also use parametric diagrams to design this 3D graphics. So uh, why don't we, we know how to do this for design? Why don't we use this to, to trace all the data? So we try to do that. And my next book, we are going to publish all these diagrams so you can reconstruct it if you want to use it for your research. It's okay. Wonderful work. We will be very glad with that. Some findings that stand out is how these canonical narratives of modern Brazilian architecture present a singular appearance, meaning they show a high degree of repetitiveness. The same, uh, each author repeats the same things and again and again and again, praising the same buildings and repeating the same stories. Yet, a close examination shows that this apparent single-mindedness unison is less tight than it seems in a first view. The charts containing all the collected information that were, uh, helped us to see that there, were, there are variations between the books. Uh, we tried some uh, blob graphics. We tried many things that worked more or less. We're still trying to understand better this one. But this the graphics uh, comparing the eight books, how each book uh, are doing things, how they repeat or not, do not repeat the same authors, the same things. These graphics were made for only for the 100 more um, quoted buildings because we had a thousand buildings. It would be impossible to put it. You can do that in a graphic, but it would be unreadable after that. So we try to make a, a, a some, some simplifications in order to better read it. Uh, there are similarities, but when you examine it further, there are also significant differences from one book to another. And the differences matter and have to be carefully considered instead of being swept under the carpet to favor a neater storyline. The works that were quoted several times were used to reiterate the identity and quote, quote, identity. But they do not remain completely static a long time and throughout these eight books. Uh, 
even the same works and authors, even if the same works and authors are mentioned, there are more or less significant variance, variations of how many importance you give to them, how many words, etc. And so, although the construction of what is being labeled as constituting the modern Brazilian architecture canon presents a high degree of consistency, it leaves room for variation and even for conflicting. However, the constant presence and quotation of the same significant number of exemplary, and by the way, magnificent, I'm not talking against this architecture, please. I do love this architecture. I'm a huge fan, I visit them, I'm always studying them. It's not a problem against the architecture, it's about against the narratives, not the architecture, to be clear. Um, uh, the presentation is also deeply emphatic that, that emphasis help elude the perception of the alterities, reinforcing the sensation of an apparent homogeneity. A feature that tends to support the idealistic idea that there is a happy accordance among all voices and the perception inside and outside Brazil that a unifying Brazilian architecture, modern and national, univocal and continuous, unfolding along an almost straight line of development is enforced since ever and forever and ever. That is obviously a problematic historiographical construction. As nothing remains the same after a century, the prevalence of a single interpretative paradigm is a curious anomaly, one that is only attainable by the systematic elimination, disregarding and forgetting of anything other than the things that corroborate it. Modern Brazilian architecture canon was modeled upon an implicit assumption, a convergence and homogeneity of thought and action among all personages. This unity, closeness, and homogeneity even seems to exist and to be proved by the canonical buildings and books. Uh, but it's only possible because a much broader reality is reduced and clipped are plainly ignored. The apparent unity is the result of a policy of exclusion and its homogeneity is obtained by the selecting what is allowed to be visible. Canals are defined by their sometimes mythical constructions and maintenance and they are maintained by the inertia they provide. This is probably an interesting exemplification of that. On the other hand, the establishment of a canon is an act constituted in a, as a monument of itself, rowing against the current of the temporal flow. And paradoxically enough, it is precisely the presence of an established canon that pressures and collaborates to its perpetuation, not only in discourses, but also in professional design practice. It stimulates in the thoughts and deeds of each new generation the will to belong to this fabricated but fascinating tradition. Yet, as change is inevitable, the ties with the past are both of continuity and alterity, and we have to deal with that. The interest of deeply studying the Brazilian modern architectural historiographical case is that it has helped us to realize how the idea of a supposed unity of Brazilian modern architecture has been kept unabated. And it's an almost, and a most extraordinary phenomenon, although probably and ultimately an unsustainable one. The good news is that there is a whole new world of Brazilian modern and contemporary architecture in the way of being researched, studied, reconsidered, or considered for the first time. That along with the consider reconsideration of the past masters and their work, which are magnificent and we love them, but we now have the task to conform a much more extended and more adequate basis for a contemporary understanding of this past. 
and a better foundation for the design of contemporary buildings and places. And now I'm going to do my, the, the, the propaganda of my next book. It's out, it's out in preparation. There will be all these graphics and tables and etc. And there will be also a collection of uh, um, articles for, from many, many friends, mostly in Latin America, but in other parts of the world, in Ibero-American, uh, talking about this idea of the recognition, the canon, its voice, and some of the, the texts are about, uh, we have a text from Professor Fernando Lara, and we have talks about women architecture, about uh, interior design, another forget, thing that is forgetting almost everywhere. Nobody talks about interior design, and it was uh, ever so important, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I will finish right now and be open to your questions. And doubts, and I hope you do have questions because I do love questions. No questions, every question is allowed. I do love them. Thank you very much.